Hello YouTube, Sidekick here with a little bit more rocket science. This is the third in the series of videos on the fine art of using rockets in DCS. This topic does appear to be the gift that keeps on giving, so we do have a ways to go in the series yet. Uh, you may want to go and watch the first two parts um, for the rest of this to make sense, though. In the first part, we looked at the history of the aerial rocket and discussed the big difference between rockets and bombs. And that is that since rockets are self-propelled, part of their trajectory is very flat and part of their trajectory is more like a bomb, where they fall farther away from the trajectory the farther away they get. Out of this, I kind of proposed that the theory that if you want to use rockets effectively, you should really figure out how far out this flat portion of their trajectory extends, because that's really the range where you want to be using them. Uh, you can use them outside this range, but it'll be a lot harder to use them effectively, as we'll see. So we did some testing in part one with the A-10, and we used the um, HUD tapes from that flight in part two to confirm the hypothesis that there really are two different regions of the site depression curve. Uh, at the end of part two, we went back out with the A-4 this time to try and get some data um, essentially acquired by firing rockets uh, on the trajectories of the FFAR 2.75-inch rocket and the Zuni 5-inch rocket. So uh, today we're going to actually analyze the data that we collected, um, and we're going to do the FFARs first. So we're going to analyze the video and build a site depression table, and then we'll go back out and fly a short mission where we attack some defended targets using FFARs to see whether A, we can actually hit anything, and B, whether we can survive the experience. So let's get started. First of all, I'll remind you that this is the table we're trying to fill out, but we need to make a little change. Uh, with the A-10, we had a range column because the HUD in the A-10 reports our range to target. We don't have that luxury with the A4, so we won't be filling in this column directly, although I'll point out that we can derive the range to target using trigonometry once we know the dive angle and the altitude, or more appropriately, the above ground height. Okay, so how are we going to get this data from the firing runs that we did? Well, uh, let's take a look. Here's the video of the site as we roll in. And now, so remember the procedure was that we fired multiple shots with the site on the target the whole time. So there's the first launch. Based on the data from the video that isn't on the screen, I'll put the parameters at the time of the launch here. Okay, let's hold the frame there. And then let's roll the video forward over here, and we're waiting to see the impacts on the ground. There. Now, let's freeze that frame as well. And now we need to go back over to our launch frame and see if we can figure out where, in this original site picture, the rounds actually landed. Well, the first one is there in the woods, and that's around 60 mils on the site. So we're going to assume that if we had set the site to 60 mils, and our aim point had been 60 mils higher, then this round would have actually hit the target. Okay, quick math geek moment. For true math geeks in the audience, I will point out that there are some issues with this argument having to do with uh, something called foreshortening of a circular target. And that means that when you look at a circular target at an angle, the top of the circle is smaller than the bottom of the circle on the ground. Um, and so what I'm saying is may not be strictly true, but I think it's probably close enough for our purposes here, given the accuracy of the rockets and a bunch of other things. Okay, let's um, take a look at the second round. Well, it landed here, which is about um, 30 mils. Which brings up another point, and that is that at this range, that's a pretty massive dispersion in those rounds. Um, so if we were actually trying to launch rockets at this range, we could expect them to be pretty well spread out on the ground. Okay, that's the first two data points for our table. Uh, let's roll the video forward again to the second launch. Okay, freeze it here and roll it forward on the right until we see the second set of impacts. There. Okay, repeat the process and we get something like this. Okay, let's do the third launch. And the fourth, which seems to have only been a single rocket for some reason.
And finally, the fifth launch. Oh, that should give us enough data to fill out the site depression table. Uh, now, I will actually tell you that I did multiple runs on the target that I didn't include in the video, and I did analyze them the same way offline. So when I compile all of that data, I get something that looks like this. Now, there are a couple of features that are interesting in this data, at least to me. Um, the first is, obviously, that it conforms to our basic pattern of having a long-range falling trajectory and a short-range flat trajectory. It looks like the flat trajectory starts at a slant range of around 5,000 feet. The second thing to note, though, is with the FFARs, is that the data gets increasingly noisy as you get outside this range, which effectively is what we saw in the video. Um, to me, this confirms that FFARs really aren't meant to be used outside that 1,500 meter, 5,000 foot range or so. Now, that is actually a lot closer than I had probably typically been trying to use them, which may explain why I didn't have a lot of success. So anyways, here is the site depression table that I would say we should use for FFARs in the A4. And I've added a data point for a 30 degree dive uh, based on the altitude that gives us land range of 5,000 feet. But basically, I think how we should fly these is to actually set our site depression to zero but then try to be in this region of the table by making sure that we're no higher than the maximum altitude that's determined by our dive angle. Anyways, let's go out and see if we can make that work. Okay, here we are uh, at Copaletti getting ready to take off. And just so you know, we are rocking the forever free A4 skin today. Isn't it? Uh, it's beautiful. All right, so let's just uh, get took off and lined up here and I'll explain how this mission we're gonna fly works. Um, we're, we're basically flying um, on the same map uh, as the iron bombing range, and the iron bombing range is still out there. But we've added a few things to this mission, so let me just explain as we get, get sorted out here. Um, so, you know, I want to try the FFARs and see how they work, uh, and actually you know, make sure we can hit stuff with them, but I think it's also important to try them against some targets, you know, that shoot back. Um, so I don't just want to go to the range. So what I've done is uh, make a little mission here that has uh, an F-10 radio menu that will allow us to activate uh, a number of targets. All of the targets, well, five of the six targets are defended targets. The uh, sixth target is an undefended con. Um, it's, they're defended more or less heavily, just so we can check out and see how that's going to work. So the other thing I'm doing here is I'm setting my uh, radar uh, warning to be at 2,500 feet, uh, which is a little bit higher than what we decided our minimum altitude or maximum altitude should be. 20 degree dive, but it'll at least give us an idea of when it's uh, safe to launch the rocket. So if we're ready to pick a target. I'm going to pick the artillery battery this time. And you see it here in a minute. It's marked with red smoke. There it is. Uh, and so basically, it's it's also got some 23 millimeters defending, uh, basically a line of BM 21s that are in a tree line. So we're basically going to go and see, uh, you know, can we take out the artillery battery with the FFARs? But also, just as importantly, um, in doing so, can we actually survive a little bit of uh, close-in triple A? So just going to go and get ourselves set up. You can see them in the tree line. It's a vague outline of 23 millimeters. All right, here we go, rolling in. So same procedure as usual, gonna get the top ring on the target, gonna roll out, just gonna let the dipper climb, We're not using any sight deflection, but we do need to wait for that low altitude warning where we are within range. It does take a while. Like a long while. There we go, safe to launch, and just had to make sure we put the master arm on there at the last minute. That's always helpful. Well, as you can see, that was actually a pretty good run. Uh, we did manage to avoid the AAA. 
So maybe we need to stay aware of the AAA. Okay, so even though I launched even later than I should have, I had to switch the master arm on at the last minute. Now you can see we were pretty close before we were able to launch, but um, we did a pretty good job on those uh, on those admittedly fairly soft targets with the FFARs. But I'm the mission is set up. Uh, with unlimited ammo, by the way. Uh, so you can have as many target passes as you want on each target. And uh, there's a little bit of life down there yet, as we saw as we were egressing. So why don't we take at least one more run on this target. Uh, this time, maybe I'll try and focus on the AAA units out in front of the tree line and see how we do against them. Once again, rolling in. Now, I think with rockets, the thing... Uh, that I'm finding is it's good to take the power off when you're rolling and get yourself lined up. But you can add the power back in a little because rockets do benefit from having a little bit faster speed too. So once you're satisfied you're lined up, you can start adding a bit more power back in. And it's coming up. There it is. And launch. And break. Well, that seemed to work pretty well. Um, got away and we also did manage to get a couple of the uh, 23 millimeter emplacements there with the rockets. Okay, so let's go up and around and take a little bit of stock. And I don't think we probably need to do that target again. I think we proved that with a you know, fairly lightly defended uh, battery of soft targets like that, that FARs are actually a pretty effective way of taking it out. Um, I'm not sure I would have said that before I started this series, so I think I've learned a little bit about how to use these rockets. Um, there's no question you have to get pretty close to the target, though. Um, definitely closer than I uh, had been using them in the past, so that's one thing I've learned at least about the FFARs. They're just not worth using at long range. Okay, let's go grab another target, uh, maybe one that's a little bit better defended. How about um, the outpost? So, take the outpost this time, and now, uh, oh, yeah, here's our remains of our artillery battery, now the outpost. Where is that? It's going to be some orange smoke. Oh, there it is. Okay, so a little bit further on there. So the outpost has some 57 millimeter as well as some 23 millimeter, so it's a little bit better defended and a little bit longer range. So oh, it's an outpost with actual infantry units in the outpost, so it'll be interesting to see whether the FFARs can actually take out infantry that's inside a building. Uh, it'll also be interesting to see if getting close enough to use them, whether or not we're actually going to be able to do that with a little bit more AAA in the area. So we're kind of doing an S-bend here, get ourselves lined up. And we can roll in there. ourselves lined up under the target there start coming up to the target start adding some power just waiting yeah definitely uh, busy neighborhood and there we go and break all right well we definitely did some damage but uh, yeah that's an exciting little approach that much AAA in the neighborhood. All right, well, let's go around and try that one again. See whether that was just luck and whether we're pressing it here by going around again. But we did find out that the 2.75s will take out infantry inside an outpost. Uh, so that's a useful thing to know. Just need to get far enough away here that we're outside the zone. Here's a nice look at that fine livery provided to us by the uh, Community A4 folks. Okay, so once again coming around. 
Maybe a little bit shallower dive angle this time. Until we get a good line on things. All right, here we go. Power back. Pull the lift vector up to the target. Stop when we get the target. Ring underneath the target. Shells lined up. Start pulling up. Start speeding up. And wait for the signal. Wait, wait, wait for the signal. There it is, and there they go. Break. Yeah, so once again, uh, don't think. I don't really think we can argue with the. I think we can argue with the accuracy of the FFARs at that range. It's not a statement I really thought I'd ever uh, say. Um, so, yeah, I think that the FFARs are redeemed a little bit in my mind. Uh, I think they are quite useful if you use them right. Um, you certainly can use them against defended locales. Um, though I wouldn't get too excited about using them in anything where there's too much AAA, but I think with a little bit of AAA uh, and a well-executed attack, you can probably get away with it. Uh, you certainly don't want to fly straight and level too long, and you don't want to keep flying or straight level long enough to examine your handiwork. You need to break as soon as you fire the, the rockets, but it can be done. So, um, in part four of this series, we're going to basically do the same thing. I'm going to build a site deflection table and fly the Zunis on this same mission. So, Tune in for that next time, and until then, this is Sidekick, signing off.